Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Samir. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this session. We're going to be talking about harnessing commerce, connectivity, and creativity in the subcontinent from mountain to ocean. So quite an agenda, and thank you for joining us for this journey. Um, as Samir said, I'm Cecile Fruman. I'm the Director for Regional Integration Cooperation in South Asia at the World Bank. And at the World Bank, we believe very much that regional integration and cooperation is a key for inclusive growth, for sustainable development, and for building a resilient South Asia. This is the only session in this RACINA program where we're focusing on South Asia, and we have a very distinguished panel of South Asian experts. And we'll be looking at how South Asia can integrate uh, within the region and also connect to the rest of the region. South Asia, as many of you know, is one of the least integrated regions of the world, and there are really great potentials for further uh, integration. Intra-regional trade is at only 5% of total trade, and that's about a third of the overall potential. Our World Bank studies and estimates show that regional integration could increase annual intra-regional trade by $44 billion. So it could expand hydropower and clean energy capacity threefold by 2040. And it could help to build a climate resilient South Asia for over 800 million vulnerable people in this region. We believe that as um, the region embarks in its post-COVID recovery and continues to strengthen growth, regional integration is key to help build a green, clean, inclusive, development and recovery. So one of the key areas of cooperation is digital connectivity and digital economy. This is a region that has made incredible strides in digital development in the past 10 years. Mobile subscriptions have increased to provide internet access to millions. The use of digital payments is on the rise. Digital ID systems improve the delivery of public, financial, and other services. And there's also booming IT industry and an innovative private sector that illustrates the potential for digital innovation and entrepreneurship in this region. Yet, we know that there are also many challenges in this area. Challenges of inclusion, of access, of governance, privacy, and data protection. So the countries of South Asia have new and exciting opportunities to work together and with the rest of the world to reap the benefits and to mitigate some of these risks. And I'd like to flag to you a new World Bank report that we've just issued called South Asia's Digital Opportunity. We do have a few copies um, at the back of the room. And this is really what's anchoring our, our conversation today. We've looked at um, opportunities at the country level and also what the region can do together to help advance this agenda in terms of connectivity, in terms of data flows and, and e-payments. So today's focus is really on what are these opportunities, what are some of the challenges, and how does South Asia come together to overcome and reap the, the full benefits. To do so, we have a very imminent uh, panel, and I'll introduce them. Um, we have Ms. Aminat Shana, who's the Minister of Environment, Climate Change, and Technology from the Maldives. Um, to my right, Ambassador Vijay Mohan Quatra, Ambassador to Nepal, and Designate Foreign Secretary. Congratulations, sir. Uh, Mr. Biswa Pudel, who is Vice Chairman of the National Planning Commission in Nepal. Um, the um, Mr. Ambassador Shahidul Haq, who's the former uh, Foreign Secretary of Bangladesh and is currently a senior fellow at the South Asian Institute of Policy and Government at the North South University in Bangladesh. Oh, welcome. And uh, Mr. Tsering Sige Dorji, who's the former CEO of the Timpu Tech Park, which was Bhutan's first and only IT tech park. So without further ado, I'm going to start with ladies first. I'll start with Aminat, and I'll ask you to talk a little bit about the role of digital in the COVID-19 recovery. 
So what we've seen in this region is that co co recovery has been slow and rather uneven across the region. But certainly what the pandemic has done is that is it has amplified the use of digital technologies and services, but also exposed the gaps in its access and its usage. So tell us a little bit about how South Asian countries and Southeast Asian countries working together can tap the potential of digitalization, and in particular, what does this mean for the Maldives? Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here to particularly speak on something that's very dear to South Asia. As you've rightly mentioned, COVID-19 taught us an important lesson. We stayed at home, and yet we moved mountains. We developed vaccines, we moved hospital beds from countries to countries. We uh, imported and exported medicines that were critical to save lives. All of this we did staying at home, using digital services to bring, to make sure that we continue to uh, implement our development agendas. South Asia is nearly two, over two billion people. We are a region of very young people as well. In the Maldives, more than 40% of our population is under the age of 40. So these are critical components for us to really utilize to enhance our development priorities, increase our resilience, uh, to uh, further our uh, relationship within countries. From systems in South Asia, from Aadhaar system to the Union Digital Service Centers, I think South Asia has really demonstrated um, advanced technologies that could be scaled up throughout um, other countries as well. I think what we need now is to move from a whole of government approach to maybe a whole of South Asia approach and um, breaking the barriers to eliminate silos that exist in our countries, to be able to learn from each other, peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing uh, w on what we can do. And I think um, countries like the Maldives stand to benefit from uh, India, from Bangladesh, who have really um, utilized and who have really implemented advanced um, techno technological solutions to provide services that are critical to our development. Great, thank you very much. I'm going to turn now to uh, Biswo for Nepal, which is a landlocked country where you also experience high broadband cost. So what do you see as the key challenges, but also the opportunities for digital transformation? And how can working with your neighbors help support this effort? Thanks, Ashin. <clears throat> I think we are very high cost you know, in, in terms of challenge. Uh, and the cost is a function of many things. You know, we have many taxes, uh, royalties, uh, VAT, very high VAT. Uh, and also, you know, we import a lot of broadband services. So, you know, that all leads to high cost. That's one challenge. Uh, another challenge is actually limited, overall limited access to internet. Uh, your report also talks about, uh, you know, only 5% of the population having access to broadband, maybe 13% of household having a laptop, you know, stuff like that. So that itself limits our access to Internet. So this will, again, you know, limit the dissemination of Internet services. These are the major challenges in popularizing broadband connection. Uh, regarding the opportunities, I think there will be many opportunities. Obviously, you know, increasing the productivity uh, in a country like ours, landlocked country, uh, you know, the internet connection will actually present uh, uh, you know, that opportunity first. And also, <coughs> excuse me, um, also uh, the, you know, the technological leapfrogging opportunity that uh, it brings uh, in using internet can be helpful on that. You know, we have sensory of uh, lack of education, so which we can actually you know, overcome by leapfrogging, uh, by using internet connection, you know, 
uh, internet technology and other things to produce new things, you know, apps and other things that we have done. So that may be useful in terms of opportunities. Um, in terms of uh, collaboration with neighbors, I think we can collaborate with a country like India, which is our immediate neighbor, in reducing cost of connection, connectivity. Um, that will be a major thing in popularizing these connections uh, and making our internet products uh, cost effective. Yes, thanks. Great, mm -hmm. thank you. Thanks. So, Shahid, turning now to Bangladesh <coughs> and BBIN, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, and Nepal, we're seeing a lot of positive momentum towards collaboration. How do you see the countries coming together? And where do you see the opportunities for doing more in terms of digital connectivity? Uh, thank you very much. I think you have rightly pointed out that uh, the uh, uh, South Asian uh, countries, in particular the countries around the Bay of Bengal, have been uh, working out, uh, which uh, you mentioned, the BBIN, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal, kind of a connectivity initiative, uh, which is primarily a sort of a physical connectivity, both in terms of roads, railways, and, uh, and the river line. But uh, within that, uh, when the uh, uh, Bay mistake or SART was defining uh, the connectivity, it did uh, took into consideration in a large extent uh, about the digital uh, connectivity. And in this, Bangladesh has uh, pioneered. Uh, we, uh, our, pri our Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, uh, sort of uh, made a commitment to the nation in 2009 after coming to the power. And that Bangladesh uh, would be made digital, and which uh, to a large extent has uh, brought a substantive change in the life and livelihood of, uh, of the people of Bangladesh. Now, in, in, certainly there was a progress, but uh, the COVID has, uh, uh, I think, brought a huge thrust and accelerated use of uh, the digital communications. Now, it has uh, sort of a, both the brighter side and the weaker side because uh, it also creates uh, uh, inequality if not properly governed. So that's one of the priorities of the government was to make sure that uh, it gets into the uh, life and livelihood of the people who are on the margin, both uh, geographically and, uh, and otherwise. So that's there. Uh, but if you talk about the uh, sort of a, both Bay of Bengal or South Asia wise, then you will see that uh, any kind of a connectivity, and you have uh, pointed out in your opening uh, uh, statement that it is the least connected uh, region, uh, if you talk globally, uh, uh, with less than 5% of trade, despite having the long history of SARC and, uh, and the other organizations. Uh, it continued to remain bilateral. Uh, so that's something we need to look at, that why it is so. Why there isn't a kind of a mindset, both at the, uh, at the policy level, um, and the people level and the business level to do more things uh, regionally uh, and, uh, and some of the business in the state and look beyond, uh, uh, beyond this region. So that's the, the other uh, issue. But uh, I'm sure there will be opportunities to talk about how we sort of uh, break the barrier. Uh, and one way that we can break the barrier is to use digital means. Uh, then we overcome a lot of... Uh, uh, physical barrier, uh, and that we have seen uh, during the COVID period, that it's possible. But in this, I think it is primarily uh, not the government, but market needs to play a major role uh, in terms of making uh, connectivity uh, a, a big force of development. Thank you. Great. So when we look at Bhutan, um, tell us a little bit, Sige, about how um, uh, digital services are helping to unleash entrepreneurship and uh, creativity in Bhutan. And how do you see the role for the region to come together to support uh, digital entrepreneurship at the regional level? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be on this panel with the highly esteemed co-panelists. Uh, beneath the Shangri-La image as a tourist destination, uh, Bhutan is a very progressive democratic constitutional monarchy. We are well rooted in our past, but we have our eyes fully set on the future. And we are guided by our development philosophy of cross national happiness, which was expounded in the 1970s by our fourth king. 
Gross national happiness is all about balance between spiritual or mental well-being and material progress, and between preserving our age-old values and harnessing the power of emerging technologies. The drive towards technology adoption and digital transformation in Bhutan is spearheaded by none other than by His Majesty the King himself. Being a small nation makes us a smart nation. Technology is an indispensable tool that will be necessary to realize this aspiration, said His Majesty the King in an address to a group of young graduates in 2019. This push has naturally brought about great dividends, uh, both for the youth as well as the public in general. And this has helped unleash creativity and entrepreneurship, as uh, Cecil has asked. It has been found that the youth are interested more in digital jobs as compared to other jobs in the agriculture or construction sector. Uh, they are the digital natives, and they see technology differently than we do. As a result of these uh, initiatives from the government side, uh, uh, there has been a number of Bhutanese youth who have started entrepreneurship in the digital space. Uh, there is some uh, growing uh, digital entrepreneurs, despite the small market size, and. Uh, there is also a growing number of uh, uh, Bhutanese creators and influencers on social media like uh, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Uh, in fact, I just found out that um, there is a YouTube channel started by one of the Bhutanese youth. That channel has more views than the, the channel of the national television station. So there's the power of technology that we can see. And at the tech park, uh, we have been able to generate employment opportunities for more than 600 people since 2016. So these are some of the visible uh, results that we can see despite uh, being a very small market and a country with a small population. Now, quickly going to the second part of the question on regional collaboration, I feel that there are a lot of opportunities and uh, I feel this opportunities are not fully tapped. Uh, just to give an example of what can be done, just before the COVID situation started in 2020, it was from 28th to 29th of February 2020, the first Bhutan India Startup Summit was organized in Bhutan, uh, which saw a number of entrepreneurs from both, both Bhutan and India participate. It was a it was a very uh, vibrant event. And now it has just been two years, and it seems that uh, you know, the things are going back to normal, as we used to know, despite all the changes. I, I feel that this kind of uh, you know, events can happen more. And it can happen between more countries in the region. We have a shared legacy and a shared uh, you know, cultural heritage. Given that background, Anything we start on top of that, I think, can go a very long way. Uh, we can take advantage of uh, these multilateral, multilateral groupings like SARC, Beamstack, or BBIN to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ambassador Quetra, turning to you, we've heard a lot now from your fellow panelists about the opportunities for digital connectivity within South Asia, BBIN, and also the broader Indo-Pacific. What do you see as other areas of potential collaboration? Thank you very much. Uh, I, I do apologize. I'm a bit of a last minute imposter in the panel. I was not supposed to be here, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think it has been uh, quite interesting listening to my fellow panelists in terms of uh, how they see the entire space of regional cooperation in the digital arena. Uh, in my view, whatever flows out of uh, partnerships in this space is, is still a very limited horizon if you look at it in the overall rubric of connectivity. It's definitely a new domain 
in the terms of uh, the way economies of uh, the Indian subcontinent and the larger regions cooperate with each other in a manner that actually extends its benefit to the people, uh, to the economy. I think it's, it's quite incipient in that stage. But I think if you look at, sorry, but I think if you look at its prospects, number one, um, number two, the speed at which it is growing, three, the directions in which it is growing. And I say this uh, uh, coming, uh, returning very fresh from Nepal, based on also my experience in, in Nepal, is actually quite amazing and promising. So, you know, if you were to, if you were to categorize this into a different specific segments in which actually the businesses in each country of South Asia, even I would say wider concentric circle of, uh, of countries in other parts, uh, in other regions, if you were to look at it, you will find that you can actually divide them into several categories and uh, 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 not just limited to some of the opportunities uh, which have been mentioned uh, by the previous panelists. So I think the, the first area in which it is actually very promising is the platform-based digital cooperation. So I'll, now, this, this sounds very techy tech, but what it essentially does is that you can have one platform in entire South Asia in which one country of the region can either market its product, service, even share its experiences with another country of South Asia. So I'll give you a classic example in Nepal. There is, uh, there is a, there is a, the two platforms, one in Nepal, one in India, have come together in a manner in which Indian product can be sold in Nepal, Nepalese product can be sold in India, the supply chains are easily interconnected. So all you do is intersect the two platforms into a cooperative opportunity, which is a specific business-related opportunity that you can use. Two, it is leading to the emergence of uh, popularity, rather, of uh, and usage of new products. So, uh, give you, for example, in the area of finance, and I think Dr. Podil from Nepal can uh, can perhaps comment much better on it. Uh, the platforms of uh, NPCI, the National Payment Council of India, in partnership with entities in Nepal, for example, are now allowing um, the uh, the use of app-based payment structures to be interoperable between the two countries, which is, which is a remarkable convenience for anybody who's traveling from India to Nepal and from Nepal to India. Uh, it's, it's a product, it's also a service, it also connects, uh, and connects remarkably well, actually, if you look at it. Uh, three, uh, most recently, which is again uh, possible essentially through the digital space, is the, is the launch of Rupay card. It's a kind of uh, uh, a credit stroke debit card. Uh, I think the current, uh, uh, current stage is that it, is, uh, it has been launched in Bhutan, for example, and most recently in Nepal. Again, the digital platform allows you to take one particular product and spread it all across the region, again, for the benefit of the people connecting it better. I think the, the, the second thing which the digital connectivity does is brings about enormous system efficiencies for trade. So there are large uh, network of uh, physical infrastructure connectivity between the two countries, between the two countries, any two countries in the region. Uh, Cross-border train networks, railroad networks, airways, uh, in case of couple of uh, countries in the region, even inland waterways, uh, these are all uh, uh, these are all physical uh, infrastructure-based uh, connectivity partnerships, which uh, have become far more efficient using the digital processes and the digital hardware which goes into that system. So the system efficiencies that the digital space brings about in the space of physical infrastructure, which then directly benefits the economy. 
But I think the larger uh, point, uh, which is point both of principle but uh, also of practice on the ground, I think which needs to be kept in mind is that ultimately the, the space of digital connectivity has to be placed in the overall rubric of, uh, of overall connectivity between the countries of the region. And I think in that space, uh, what we need to keep in mind is that whatever initiatives we launch, it, it, this is irrespective of the space really, one, have to be financially responsible, two, have to be economically viable, and naturally have to be extremely mindful of, uh, of uh, the, the, the sovereignty and the territorial integrity concerns of the countries involved. Uh, and I say this because in the end, uh, uh, connectivity per se, irrespective of the domain in which you practice, is meant for the benefit of the people. And I think if you follow these principles and practice them actually on the ground, uh, not only would you have a more efficient uh, uh, connectivity partnership, in this case digital, but you will also have these partnerships being widely accepted across the population in pretty much most of the region. Uh, uh, the, 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 my colleague from Bhutan talked about the, uh, the, the startup initiative. I think that's, that's another offshot of, of, the, of the digital connectivity partnerships, which is that the entire rapidly growing innovation space in India, the startup space in India, both in terms of products, in terms of services, again in terms of platforms, um, is actually uh, spreading very rapidly across the region and purely through, you know, private, uh, private mechanisms. For example, in Nepal, uh, there have been at least uh, three iterations of uh, what we call as global conclaves in which what we try to do is uh, bring together small, successful, IT-enabled services startups in India and uh, the prospective partners, at least in this case in Nepal. I'm sure this is a template which can easily be replicated across other countries too. Bring them together. They look at product services. They use the digital medium, find a solution, and turn into a commercial-based agreement and move on with life, really. So I think, I think the overall, this is a very promising space. It's also the space which Minister Shauna mentioned about the, uh, the, the region being very young in population. It connects intuitively with, you know, uh, with their aspirations, uh, with, uh, it's their comfort zone, let me put it across this way. So I think all in all, something of great promise. Yes, there are challenges, particularly relating to the, I would say, speed of connectivity in some ways. Uh, also in terms of uh, the cost of the bandwidth which goes across. Um, but I think it is equally important to keep in mind sometimes that whatever bandwidths, networks, speeds you operate, they eventually have to be safe and secure bandwidth and networks also. You would not want to partner uh, with the networks in a manner where what you put out in terms of your data uh, and other aspects of it is actually compromised in that. So you need to be very sure that if you are moving on a network, if, you're, if your financial details are moving on a network, the network is safe and secure and trusted and that's it. I think there also India offers a, a, ph a phenomenal opportunity in terms of uh, extending whatever capacities are available with us, um, with the region at large, so that when we grow together as a region, we grow together not just in terms of economic prosperity, but also in a manner which is safe and secure, at least in the digital space. I think let me stop here. I'm sure there will be questions on this. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And um, I do have more questions for the panel, but I also want to give an opportunity to our audience to come in. So we have a few mics um, in the room. If you'd like to line up and uh, prepare your questions, now would be the time. And I see that we already have a few questions in the back. Oh, please go ahead. Um, good evening. Am I audible? And please, yeah. please introduce yourself also. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Ria Sinha from the Center for Social and Economic Progress, New Delhi. I have two questions for Mr. Dorji. 
Um, first, uh, do you see the gross national happiness and connectivity as contradictory? Because as exemplified by Bhutan not taking up the recent BBI and MBA, that sort of indicates in that direction. Uh, my second question to you is, how do you see social media growth and penetration in Bhutan? Is it changing the traditional um, social and political setup in the society? Thank you. Thank you. Let's take uh, uh, another couple. Good yes, evening. Please my go name ahead. is Diego Yosa. I'm from Peru. I'm a young uh, Resina young fellow. And uh, for me, this session is very interesting because there are many challenges that are shared between the Latin American region, but also South Asia. And even though we are far distant, we share challenges with respect to connectivity, digital economy, and in part it's explained because of the geography and the transaction costs. But I see that in Latin America there are several initiatives, regional initiatives within Mercosur and the Pacific Alliance that are trying to work on, with regard to the single window, uh, infrastructure, etc., to improve connectivity, to improve digital economy t between our economies. So my question is to any of the speakers willing to respond it. If do you think there is a scope for mutual cooperation between Latin America and South Asia in this regard, like South-South cooperation uh, between regional organizations such as SARC with Mercosur or Pacific Alliance, or cooperation, bilateral cooperation or cooperation between uh, regional organizations. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, let's take one more over here. Oh, good, e good evening, I'm Maitre Naidu. I'm an officer trainee with the MEA. Uh, my question is, we have seen that those who set the rules have uh, benefited from the rules. And given that South Asia is the largest market for digital technologies, whether and if yes, how can South Asian countries come together to create a system of rules for trade in digital technologies, digital products and services, as well as digital security, uh, which can then be scaled up and, access, uh, and accepted by the rest of the world? Thank you. All right. So, um, CA, there were a couple questions for you at the beginning. Uh, do you want to take those? Yep. Um, so there were, there were two questions uh, directed at me. Uh, thank, thank you for the questions. Uh, first one was whether I see GNH, cross-national happiness, philosophy, and connectivity as contradictory. I, I don't. Uh, I am an engineer by background, and uh, I see technology as a tool. And any tool can be used either for good or bad. So. Uh, as long as we, are, we make a very conscious choice of how to use the technology, including connectivity, I think we can use technology for good. And uh, while this balancing act can be challenging, I, I think they need not be contradictory, and I feel that technology can be used to enhance GNH. On the second question on social media and its impact on the, I think, political and social setup, uh, traditional political and social setup. Um, social media is very powerful. Uh, uh, it definitely has a lot of influence and a lot of impact, especially on the young people. And uh, now, uh, the social media is, I think, one of the strongest media, I think, in ma many countries. And now it is becoming so, even in Bhutan. So there is definitely a big impact. And uh, I think how we make a conscious choice of min minimizing the negative impact is really up to us. Uh, and uh, I think we can only learn as we go along. So we don't have a silver bullet to overcome the negative impacts, uh, I think, uh, in, in, in advance. So we can learn as we go. And I think we can minimize the negative impacts and use this as a tool for the good rather than for the bad. Thank you. Thank you. I'll turn now to um, anyone on the panel who'd like to respond to the two other questions. Uh, cooperation between South Asia and Latin America and the rules-based system for trade. Who would like to go? Can Ambassador? Please no, please go ahead. Hmm? Thank you very much. I think first to the question uh, of our friend, young friend from Peru with regard to cooperation between Latin America and South Asia. Um, uh, let me give you an example, which is a concrete example. Uh, 
which uses the digital platform based engagement to advance cooperation in a non digital space but extremely important not in itself but also in terms of its derivative impact on the climate change and that's about the cooperation in the solar space so for example if you look at the international solar alliance the the, the secretariat of the international solar alliance what it does for you is it provides a platform essentially for global collation of solar based technologies practices sops which can then be shared among the membership of the international solar alliance through this medium with effectively zero cost uh, a classic example of a platform being used to extend uh, 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 the best practices the technology solutions uh, in a in a in an energy space which is also climate friendly i'll give you another example and a lot of this actually uh, uh, has come through during the last uh, uh, couple of years of covid-19 that uh, the world has gone through uh, which i would call digital connectivity as a solution to the crisis for example so uh, we have uh, and i'm sure the rest of south asia also has built platform based solutions which are easily replicable easily scalable to any other part of the world including latin america of course there is a language interface involved which is not a problem because the source code for most of these apps is actually freely available uh, one of the things which uh, at least we have tried to do in india is make whatever solutions we come out in the digital space for public benefit make them human centric in order so that the source code which goes behind or the or the ground work which goes behind in creating that particular platform is freely available to the rest of the societies not just in south asia but across the world anywhere uh, to be used these are two of the example there are several other examples but the specific answer i think to your question is yes there is a remarkable opportunity in the digital space because that's the that's that's the unique nature of this this particular uh, area which is that uh it allows you to bridge the geographies uh at effectively no extra cost um and the language of zero and one is common to whether it's latin america or it's india or south asia to the second question uh, of the young lady here with regard to the to the standards i think it's a very important question i think something which uh, since we are by nature as an average person perhaps not highly security conscious tend to maybe uh, view it measure it lightly but i think it's it's a very serious issue that's why towards the end of my remarks i pointed to the need of having safe stable secure and trusted source when you operate in the digital space and as you transition from 4g to 4g plus which i think most of the economies at least in south asia are transitioning to and then from 4g plus to 5g and then from 5g to 6g this 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 importance of having a trusted technology base which relies on standards will become extremely important and i think this is something where the countries of the south asia need to come together to ensure that the platforms they use the networks on which their data flows are safe secure and trusted because once you move to 5g you will no longer be able to control uh, uh, have a full control over your uh, uh, over over the data that flows on those infrastructures simply because the standards for those would not be in your control uh, that's the very nature of, of 5g you can control the standards at which you provide the services but if the standards on which the hardware is built is not in your control frankly you will have no control over the services beyond a point you might have a limited degree of control so i think something very important something definitely uh, a space for uh, for all of us to look at collectively individually we are in india for example there is a very acute focus on on this particular area that the 
the, the infrastructure, the digital infrastructure, the hardware infrastructure, uh, and even the, uh, the, the, the embedded software in it on which your uh, data flows is absolutely safe, secure, and in your control. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Would you like to add? Thank you very much. While I fully agree with the distinguished ambassador from India, but very good question uh, from our colleague about the rules. That reminds us that uh, technology uh, is also not politically neutral and a value neutral. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, coming uh, quite uh, strongly in, in the global politics. So, both in terms of production, use, and subsequent consequences of technology and digital in this particular uh, question, uh, needs uh, rules. Rules uh, to make sure that it doesn't become a tool of exploitation, number one. Rules so that everybody knows as to what is expected when they're using the digital space. So in that, it, it, uh, it reminds us that when the trade uh, rules were being uh, set up, uh, negotiated, you know, post-World War 60s, 70s, 80s, before the WTO came into big, there was a lot of uh, discussions uh, where most of the developing countries were in the margin of the debate. So I'm sure that this time around, the uh, developing countries would also uh, play a critical role uh, in setting rules, norms uh, for both production, use, and managing the consequences of digital world, uh, which is not easy because uh, of strong presence of market, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, market normally uh, runs by its own philosophy, which not essentially and not always uh, favors uh, the people that the distinguished ambassador has been mentioning, also a state. So there needs to be a, a platform uh, where these things could be broadly discussed. There are, uh, these are being discussed both in the international organization, WTO, WIPO, uh, ITU, and other places, but I think regionally we should also have a platform where we can also then spell out as to what is that we need out of the new rules that's in the making. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know we only have a couple of minutes left, so I'd like to turn to our panelists to see if they want to share any final concluding remarks, anything that this conversation has spurred that you'd like to share with us. Thanks, Sushil. Uh, I, I, I think the last question was really important. Uh, I agree with both ambassadors uh, on their comment, but also I think we need to be mindful about, uh, you know, when we talk about setting our own rules, some countries have, uh, you know, tried to develop their own digital platforms, set their own rules, and it has led to, you know, let's say, you know, increasing, uh, you know, autocratic tendency within those countries also. So it may not necessarily, you know, when you reject the integration with the rest of the world, it, you may be asserting your independence, but uh, by choosing not to be in the committee of nations or, you know, whatever it is, you may also be isolating a certain part of, you know, population. And that could be disastrous. So, so, you know, a lot of these things, uh, you know, when we try to rewrite the rules of engagement, we have to be mindful of that. Great. Thank you. I mean, uh, any final thoughts? For the session? No. Mm -hmm. For the session. We only have a, a minute and ten seconds left. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to mention something that's very important and close to my heart as well. How can we use technology for uh, monitoring of what's happening in our country because of the impacts of climate change. We are 1,200 islands and the most uh, drastic changes that we are seeing because of climate change is coastal erosion, increased flooding and unpredictable weather. We could use available technology to address all of these using satellite technology and drone technology to monitor coastal erosion for us to be able to use data-driven policy decision-making. Also um, using technology for early warning systems and um, using wave modeling technology for us to be able to predict flooding is critical. 
So for, as a country that is battling climate change, also an island nation, which is also a very large ocean state, we can't develop without uh, the use of technology and integrating data in a safe cyberspace. This is critical. And how could we use this at a regional scale is the question that we are trying to address. And I think we stand to benefit as a cooperation, as a regional bloc, when we work together, uh, because the issues that we face are very similar in all our countries, from mountains to the oceans as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I gave you the first word and I'll give you the last. We're going to wrap up this session. And I think um, you'll agree with me that this has been a very good illustration of the potential for digital development and digital economy. I think we've heard from each country um, how it can spur development, how it can spur recovery, and also how important it is for countries in this region to cooperate, to come together, to build common platforms, common solutions, and also to branch out and work with uh, other parts of, of the continent and the Indo-Pacific and beyond. So also, this contains challenges, clear challenges in terms of equity, inclusion, accessibility, and we talked a lot about the importance of trust, the importance of safeguarding privacy, and the governance of data. So it's a tall agenda, but I really want to thank my fellow panelists for your um, wonderful remarks and to our audience for being with us. I'm sure there were many more questions that we just didn't have time to entertain, but hopefully you'll find uh, opportunities to interact with our panelists outside of this session. Thank you all very much, and I wish you all um, good proceedings with the rest of the afternoon. Thank you.